It really was the game that had everything. Cuando el partido se abre y aún conduciendo como entrenador, cuando el partido se abre rápido, sabes que algo más. England against Argentina was one of the greatest games in World Cup history because of the drama, because of the sending off, because of the reaction of the 10 England players, because the star was born, because one of the greatest goals of all time had lit up the, the, the tournament. Because of the resilience, because of the support of the fans, because of the drama that continued afterwards. It's like you're up in the skies and you're just saying, it can't get better. And then all of a sudden you're down in the dirt. It was September 96, went to Moldova to see England play away. David Beckham's first game for England, I think it was Gaza's last game, and just got the bug. I certainly did travel to Rome. The best nil-nil game I've ever seen in my life. The qualifying campaign definitely affected the hopes and expectations. We'd come through a difficult group. You know, we'd lost to Italy at home. Zola was magical that night. And we went to Italy and we got a draw, which we, not many people expected us to get. So there was some degree of expectation. Rome was inspiring for England for many reasons. First, it showed that Hoddle could handle the build-up, the tense build-up, going to a difficult place and tactically set the team up brilliantly. There was no alcohol for the England players to celebrate, but Gazza, who remembered where doping control was, and went in there and opened the, the fridge and nicked some beers and took them back to the, uh, the away dressing when England deservedly celebrated. I think there was a buzz about the possibility of England winning this tournament when you looked at the, the quality of the, the, the squad. Yeah, there were one or two issues and then obviously Hoddle uh, wanted to bring Eileen Jury to, uh, to, to, to France and everyone was going on about, you know, is she a psychologist, is she a faith healer? And there were headlines of England flying out to France on a mumbo jumbo jet. So it was the usual mix of um, hype, confidence and a fair bit of nonsense along the way. There was a lot of glamour in English football at that time, the explosion of the Premier League, more interest in the players, and not simply interest in them as footballers, but in their lifestyles as well, and that obviously was embodied by uh, David Beckham. The football started to be uh, almost on the same level as, you know, pop stars, rock stars kind of thing, film stars, you know, on the same level. You've got to remember that the the build-up to the tournament was all about trouble and, you know, it was a bit scary. Um, I can remember in Marseille going into a supermarket the day before the England-Tunisia game and it's the only supermarket I've ever visited in the, in the world where the aisles were being patrolled not just by security but by Alsatian dogs. And I thought, yeah, this is quite a rough part of town uh, and that was where it kicked off on the beach on, on, on match day. Uh, of course, what happened in the campaign was that so, so often we lost a game which we should have, should have won. Uh, we lost a game to Romania, the second game, which meant that we finished second in the group, which meant we were then going to play Argentina in the group 16. Sí, habíamos visto toda la ronda preliminar acá por televisión. Creo que era Japón, Jamaica y Croacia. Y después de Croacia viajamos a París y de ahí fuimos a Saint Etienne para ver el partido con Inglaterra. No, sí, ya se, ya se sabía que íbamos a jugar con Inglaterra, lo cual hacía que todo sea mil veces más emocionante y, y, y la, el nivel de nervios subía porque era como, era como demasiado temprano para jugar con Inglaterra o con un, un rival de peso, pero como, como sí, como la primera ronda había sido muy buena, Había mucha fe que nos podía ir bien y podíamos pasar a, a cuartos de final. Venían todo, venían de un proceso, ¿no? Porque Pasarela los había tenido también desde muy chico eh, a, a esa base de, de jugadores. Eh, habían jugado juntos los Juegos Olímpicos eh, en el 96. Eh, se creía bastante en este equipo. No era el equipo eh, que tenía tanto brillo como el de, que dirigió Alfio Basile en el 94. Pero tenía jugadores eh, de un nivel superlativo, como Batistuta en el ataque, como Ariel Ortega, 
eh, y después tenía jugadores, eh, muy buenos jugadores, eh, de, en la mitad de la cancha, como Diego Simeone, por ejemplo. It was hot, Marseille, boiling. Uh, but, you know, you, you, you're just buzzing. You're buzzing, you, you, you're, you're seeing the, the fans. You're living a dream. You're playing for your country. You're working your socks off. That's the one, really, you know, playing for your country. There was huge excitement that it was Argentina because immediately all the footballing stories come back. Ratten in 66, Maradona 86. And people talk about revenge and one or two people strayed into the, the Falklands narrative. Yeah, of course, there's the uh, rivalry. Glenn Hoddle didn't kind of um, you know, feed on that. Uh, it, for us, it was a game that we, we, we needed to win. We wanted to go to the next level, um, get into the quarterfinals. So, but obviously behind the scenes, the tension is there. Um, and it was, you know, it was a titanic game. Oh, hay una, una concentración y un estado de... Eh, Nada, no sé si una mezcla de, de concentración y miedo con lo que hay en juego eh, en la previa del partido y cuando salimos al reconocimiento de campo también estaba el equipo inglés y Ortega, que siempre era uno de los más desinhibidos, entró al vestuario y en el silencio que, que había lo primero que se le ocurrió decir era qué lindo que era Beckham. Entonces todos distendidos, riendo. Por la cantidad de hinchas ingleses que me rodeaban, la situación no daba para cantar. Eh, y a los cinco minutos, Argentina tiene un penal. Y cuando yo sal, empiezo a gritar y a saltar penal, me entro a abrazar con mi padre, que nos habían cobrado un penal a los cinco minutos del primer tiempo. Recibo un golpe de puño en el costado derecho de mi rostro de un hincha inglés que tenía dos dientes. Um, I remember uh, being told that, uh, I think it was the late Brian Moore was commentating for ITV and he was, he was being a bit critical of the England fans, a miserable lot as always, you know, lots of the no surrender business and Royal Britannia and all, all the rest of it. And, and at the other end, all the Argentine fans are jumping up and down, obviously in their vertical blue and white striped shirts. He said, what a fantastic carnival atmosphere. Why can't we have an England fan culture like that? And I asked them, Argentinian friend, I said, what, what, what were they chanting? It seemed, seemed quite a good song, you know, really jolly. He said, oh, what they were chanting? If your mother's not an English whore, jump in the air. But, ah, right, okay. Hey, we've got to go again. We've got to go again. And that's the confidence we had. We got to go again. You know, people say football's like theatre. It was theatre. It was. You know, you, you sometimes feel, where is this game going? Where is it going? What other turns, what other twists uh, are, are going to be slung at us? You know, and um, and there was a lot of twists and turns. A lot of us have been watching Michael Owen as he came through the ranks uh, to Liverpool. I remember the first goal he ever scored at uh, I think it was at Selhurst Park against. Was it, I think it was at Wimbledon and. The moment he scored, he ran into the net, picked up the ball. There was no celebration. Went back, put it on the uh, on the centre circle. So you knew then that this was a, this was a talented, driven player. So we were just waiting for Michael Owen to to, to take off. We didn't realise he was going to be quite as spectacular as he did. Obviously, won the penalty. Desde atrás lo veo yo. En el inicio de la jugada, al primero que le gira cuando él corta en diagonal hacia la derecha, creo que es a mí, controlando hacia adentro. Hay, hay, hay una foto que tengo de, de ese partido en donde yo con la pierna derecha trato de anticiparle para que él no se haga de la pelota, pero era, estaba en el aire. Mike it. I said to myself, okay, he's, he's took the ball, right, he's going to pass it off to anybody. And then goes past one, goes past two. A Shamrock comes across, and then Ayala comes across. And even though he's drifting to the right, there's a reason for him doing that. He wants to isolate the goalkeeper. He's like a, he's almost like a chess 
Grand Master setting up an ambush. So he draws Carlos Rueda out, and then Michael's got that ability just to dink the ball from right to left past him. One of those classic moments when there's a split second pause and then the England fans who were scattered all around the ground. There were even some right in the middle of the hardcore Argentinian supporters. I looked down at them just to see if they were celebrating and there were four of them going absolutely crazy, surrounded by a sea of blue and white uh, and stony-faced Argentinians. Argentina estuvo muy cerca de quedar 3 a 1 abajo. O sea, la estaba pasando mal antes, antes de ese gol. Y ese gol fue una jugada preparada que después contaron los protagonistas, contó el propio Pasarela, que no salía, no le salía ni siquiera en los entrenamientos. Pero la tenían preparada, la tenían ahí guardadita como para ver si en algún momento podían sorprender. Y vaya si sorprendieron, porque el que apareció más libre fue Zanetti. Eh, los ingleses controlaron, trataron de controlar más que nada a los atacantes argentinos. Y Zanetti quedó ahí y lo terminó definiendo eh, de zurda, ¿no? Y obviamente, sí, la, la verdad que nos sorprendió, te diría, tanto como el gol de Owen, eh, no por la, por la concepción de la jugada, que el de Owen fue un golazo, sino por la forma en que llega Argentina al empate. Y más en ese momento, claro. O sea, sobre el final del primer tiempo era, bueno, vamos a descansar 15 minutos, con toda la tensión acumulada, empezamos de cero y se define todo en 45 minutos. I've spoken to the players since and I know that they were disappointed going in at half-time. The Argentinians were obviously buoyed. But I still think there was so much confidence in that England team. There was a lot of determination in there. They also realised that Owen had the running of that uh, Argentinian defence. They looked scared, the Argentinians, when Michael Owen picked up the ball. England were caught by a sucker punch. Bueno, el campo me, me sorprendió como imprevistamente un jugador pudiera hacerse expulsar de esa manera. You know, when you look at the kick, I think if if you did that kick now, you might just get a yellow. I think you would get, um, you know, a red. It was more petulant. The Argentinians had known that uh, Beckham had a petulant streak, could be ambushed, and he fell for it with, uh, with Simeone's uh, reaction. Simeone uh, kind of almost fallen around like he's been poleaxed by, by some kind of machine. The Argentinian players like Almeida and Batistuta surrounded uh, Kim Mills and Nielsen. Go, they were pressurizing the, the, the referee. And he sent him off. Después sí, las imágenes en donde el cholo exagera un poco la reacción de, de, Beck, de Beckham y logra este, que lo expulsen. The way England played after that, it wasn't simply the stamina, the lion-hearted, the bloody-mindedness of in some people like that. It was the tactical sophistication which they took on one of the most intelligent teams in the world. And, you know, what do you want? What do the fans want? They want players to attack, they want to, for them to play with pride in the shirt, and England did both, all ten men. You know, I, I don't think I'm ever going to forget that moment, really. You know, literally, Ecstasy, unbelievable. We're, 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 we're nearly there, and then you've got to leg it back because they've done a restart. It's like you're up in the skies and you're just saying, It can't get better. And then all of a sudden, you turn around and you're down in the dirt with your face, you know, in the mud, and you've got to get back. And it was only a stretched out leg from Darren Anderson that saved us because if they scored that it was all over. Well I think by that stage of the game you're always, always writing and there was frustration that Sol Campbell's uh, goal wasn't given, Shearer apparently fouled uh, Carlos Rua so you know that was frustrating but at that stage of the game you're not necessarily taking in emotion it's all about hitting the deadline and getting the uh, and getting the presses rolling. Suffolk just says you've got to keep on going for your country. Keep on going for your country. You know, you, every last kind of, you know, uh, bit of energy left in your body, just give it up and just go for it. You just, you know, that's how, 
how you win. We're worried, obviously, yeah. After the first, you know, five, and then it, it, it's, you have to look around, and eventually, if it, w it would have come to me, <laughs> eventually, you got to take one. Finales fue algo cuando rompí Crespo, rompí en llanto, y mi hijo me agarró y me dijo que no te vean llorar. Pero yo sabía que el debate lo atajaba. Yo el de Inns, yo pensé que Inns la iba a clavar, pero el de Bati, ya como lo veías caminar a Bati, estaba, estaba muerto. Estaba por el tan mirando el piso. Ya te das cuenta cuando hay un jugador que... Eh, te das cuenta, ¿no? No, no, no va a ser gol. Y David Bati era eso. Two of the most lion-hearted players, Inns and Bati, took penalties, and it's, it wasn't really their thing. You know, it was it was brutal. And if Beckham had been on the pitch, Beckham would have taken one. So, you know, an extra frustration with him being sent off. You, you feel empty. You know, everybody, there's some people probably thought, uh, you know, it was their fault. Uh, some people thought, you know, maybe, maybe if I'd done this, I'd done that. Um, others saying, you know, this is, this is my last World Cup. We tried. Eh, yo creo que es uno de los partidos que, que inevitablemente, aunque el tiempo pase, se siguen recordando. ¿no? Nunca voy a olvidarme que nos tocó eliminar a Inglaterra en octavos de final de una Copa del Mundo. And then you saw the Argentinian bus, which was very close by. In fact, it was so close, one of the England uh, reporters actually got on it by mistake. The Argentinians, understandably, were celebrating. They were all singing, and this has got to be put into perspective. Two or three of them probably turned around and they saw the England players and they saw the England families just trying to, you know, trying to console the England players. And there were a few taunting songs directed at one or two of the England players. Just no class at all. Now, what are you doing? You know, you know, tops off, you know, whirling their, their shirts around, banging on the window. We've got our kids and people, kids and wives and girlfriends, and just looking at them, just a bunch of kind of idiots. It certainly wasn't all the Argentinians, and it certainly didn't go on for too long. But it went on long enough, and it hurt enough for uh, certainly one or two individuals like Michael Lowen, who was. 18 at the time to sort of mutter to those around him next time. Es una sensación inexplicable ganar la Inglaterra por un mundial en un mundial. Es muy muy gratificante. It was more than a football game, you know, more than a football game. There was there's war in there, there's past battles. Um, and it seemed like it was all rolled up in, into one. From the headline in the Daily Mirror the next day was uh, 10 lions and one stupid boy. And I remember Hoddle stepping off the, uh, stepping off the, the plane at Luton or wherever it was, and he just shrugged. He'd done everything, and, and England got a good reception, and they, they certainly deserved it. The problem with uh, France 98, and you knew it was going to be a huge issue, first because we had an issue with, with Hoddle not practicing penalties. We say, why aren't you practicing penalties? We had this narrative with him in the lead up to it, and it intensified when England got out of the, the group phase. And he said, well, you can't replicate the pressure. And we said, well, does a golfer not practice so that when he steps onto the 18th fairway at St Andrews that all his technique psychologically he's got the right mindset to, uh, to, to, to deliver from a set piece. I, I, I don't actually think it's a pressure thing. I don't think it's a pressure thing. I think it's just, um, I think it's just a mindset thing, you know? Not a pressure of taking the penalty. I think we've just got to, you know, believe that we can win uh, in, in penalties and, and uh, and I think that could change the mindset for us. No, no, no. Vi, vi, o sea, vi definiciones por penales que, que siempre son muy, muy tensas, muy, muy especiales. Pero esta tenía una connotación incomparable eh, porque era Argentina Inglaterra y uno de los dos, desgraciadamente, se tenía que volver 
después de haber entregado todo, después de haber... Eh, yo creo que, a ver, termina el partido, eh, los 90 minutos, y yo creo que la mejor definición era, bueno, ganaron los dos. Pero bueno, el fútbol es esto, los mundiales tienen esto, que por eso siguen teniendo tanta atracción, que bueno, llega un momento que es a todo o nada. Y las reglas son estas. Este, pero no, obviamente una definición de este tipo nunca la había vivido.